All right, I have decided that I'm going to bust a move and start getting into the stuff that the Lord had shared with me, has been sharing, and is yet sharing with me in relationship to the prodigal son story. <clears throat> the prodigal son story in itself is pretty simple, and it's been pretty simple up to now. Um, but we are going to take a visit to the Word of God all over the place. But we're going to take it one, one little section at a time. And the first one we're going to go to, because this, this uh, story in the Old Testament sets up a whole lot of stuff in other places in the Bible. <clears throat> it helps us to understand the Lord. It helps us to understand his viewpoint. Um, uh, instead of trying to fit eternal reality and an eternal God into our viewpoint, the way we see things, we're going to try to lay out the scriptures for a little while so that we can begin to, to notice some differences here. In, in, uh, and um, what I'm going to be sharing tonight, at least for sure the first session, is... Uh, just going to be kind of setting things up, but it's important that you <clears throat> it's important that you follow now because it's leading somewheres, not just somewhere. <laughs> and that's not southern talking there. That's it's to a bunch of wares. <laughs> and so um, it's going to be good. And if we get to the second class that I have as my second class, which we probably won't. But if we do, it's just incredible. It is just incredible. And it takes a story that we all know and it puts it, woo. All right. So turn with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 1. And we're going <clears> to... <throat> We're going to look at the first Passover. We're going to lead up to the first Passover, and we're going to look at it. And you have to look. You have to think of it this way, and that is that <clears throat> the Passover was obviously the biggest event that Israel had, and they constantly, every year, commemorated it. And if you ever just did a little search, like a scripture search or something, uh, throughout, you know, you could call up the the Passover or the, the coming out of Egypt or uh, what, whatever words you use to get there, you would find that this is brought up constantly, constantly, constantly. And um, so <clears throat> we want to look there. Um, and in the first chapter and in verse, starting with verse 10, what we're going to see is... Um, the plight of Israel. Hello, Mike Fitz, brother. You look thin and tan. I look fat and white, but anyway. <laughs> Amen. Um, so Exodus chapter one and verse ten. And and remember, this is this is dealing with the people of God that are oppressed, and. Um, it's going to start setting the stage for God to move, for God to act. It's going to set the stage for why God moves, why God acts. It's going to, it's going to lay a foundation for, um, actually it's going to lay a foundation for past things. It's going to lay an explanation for past things in the Bible. So here's the, here's the hope and promise of what we're doing, especially with this, the Exodus right here. What we're doing is we could actually lay a template whereby it could make it easier to know the Bible because it's a very common pattern that's used over and over. So, but to get there, you have to, you have to learn the pieces. You have to learn the pieces. All right, Exodus chapter 1, starting verse 10. <clears throat> come on, let us deal wisely with them, talking about Israel, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when 
there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities. So, so you're seeing a you're seeing a contrast here. You're seeing that. Uh, what they are doing is they are setting taskmasters to afflict them in their burdens. Okay, aren't our burdens enough? <laughs> okay, but he's, he's setting the taskmasters to afflict us in our burdens, and we'll see this over and over. It is to keep us away from what's really important to God. It's to keep us busy. It's to keep us distracted. All right, But at the same time that they're setting those over the people of God to afflict them in their burdens, uh, they are also, the, um, and they built treasure cities for Pharaoh. Okay. So, of course, we, we are building the treasure cities for somebody else, but we're not knowing the Lord. We are busy, but we're not knowing the Lord. Okay? Verse 12, <clears throat> But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And there they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve <laughs> was with rigor. That's a, what do you think of that statement? Um, verse 14, they made their lives bitter, okay, with hard bondage. Uh, in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them to serve with rigor. That's called keeping them busy, okay? All right, now let's go to uh, chapter 2 and verse 23. <clears throat> we'll read just three verses here. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groanings and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. All right, so they are crying out because of the bondage. Okay, it says that twice, by reason of the bondage. All right, so this is important. The, the, the bondage, the situations that we're in, the, the work situations, every situation that is keeping us uh, in bondage, that is keeping us busy, um, we cry by reason of that bondage, but we're trying to get out of something. And God has something he wants to bring us into. And that's always the case. That's always the case. Because... Um, because of things that we're going to share. <laughs> um, and so it's important for us to, uh, to, to at least see and hear that tonight, that those things, see, God could have come down and delivered them at any time. They've been down there for 400 years. God could have come down at any time, but he's coming down now. So... You know, why? I mean, God is coming to the rescue. God is going to deal with the enemy. God is going to bring deliverance. God is going to bring them into something special, something wonderful. Um, and right now, all they know is they want to be free from their bondage. They want to be free from the work. They want to be free from just serving all the time. And and um, uh, and there's no vision. There's no vision in their heart to pursue something. And that's 
that's a problem because they're gonna they're not gonna really hear when God speaks they're not gonna hear because they're only gonna hear whatever he says in the context of their immediate lives and in the context of their bondage and in the context of their fears and in the context of, of, of the, all the distractions that they know are wrong. Can I get amen there? <laughs> they know they're wrong, but it's, it just keeps on going. And so they go, oh, God, you know, deliver me. Okay, well, that's good. God can deliver us. And in this case, we'll deliver, but we have to find what's in his heart. Then we have to start making provision for, for why he delivered us. Provision in our heart. Provision in our hearts. Because if we don't, we'll probably go back in bondage in the wilderness. Oh, I think they did do that. And in the promised land. All right. So, um, the God of their fathers shows up. <clears throat> so he brings up this covenant. Hmm. He brings up this covenant, this Abrahamic covenant, something that Paul brings up in Galatians and says this was before the law. And he says, it hasn't been done away with. It hasn't been done away with. You can read it in Galatians. It's not gone. The law is dealt with. It's gone. But the Abrahamic covenant is not gone. And it says, when did he get this covenant? In circumcision or in uncircumcision? He received it in uncircumcision. And then he walked in it. You can say he walked in it in heart circumcision. So, um, Exodus 3 now. And we're going to look at uh, verse, start with verse 6. <clears throat> this is uh, Moses now before God in the wilderness as God's getting ready to call him, if I remember correctly. Is that what this is? Yeah. Okay. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, remember, we noted that back up here uh, in uh, chapter 2 and verse 24, and here we're meeting it in chapter 3, and it's being brought up by God. Because there's something happened, there's something happened with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And it was the same pattern. It's the same pattern. The, there's free will. Remember this. There's free will in every situation. So, so that means that they all have different variables, but they all end up basically in line with God, in covenant with God, um, those three do. And that's why it's the God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sam. You know, Sam's not mentioned. Uh, there is no Sam, but, well, Samuel, but, you know, this, you know, there is no Sam because he didn't line up with the covenant. All right? <clears throat> Is that, is that funny? Am I a clown to you? <laughs> Sorry, that's a movie. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, starting again in verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of. I am the God of. He didn't say, I'm your God. He said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. All right. Now, what is one of the defining realities or, or things about Moses that we know in the long term? What? He saw God face to face. 
Okay. But right now, he's, no, he didn't want to see him face to face. No man had seen God and lived. Well, how did, that, how did Moses see God face to face and live? He didn't. Let me, let's just jump. Let's just jump to uh, not, don't turn there, but 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that we are changed by looking into his face and we are changed from one glory to the other glory. That's, that's where the change comes. But the change is death and life. Death and life. See, God's not playing around. It's not wounding and happiness or something weird that we would want. It's death and life. It is, it is a decrease and an increase, or an increase and a decrease. It is in its very nature. It can be taught, it can be taught, and it can be comprehended on a mental level, and particularly on a uh, doctrinal level. Um, but when it happens, it is absolutely a death and life situation. It is not halfway. It is not, well, I'm, I'm really wounded, you know, and I don't know I'll ever really recover from this. Well, then you haven't had it happen. It's not a wounding. It's not sitting in the back room laying in your deathbed but still alive. It is a genuine reality that takes place when we see him, the change is from him to us, his nature, not that we're God, not that we're Jesus, but he is in us, but that part of us that was in control, that old nature, that thing that demands all the things that the world can offer and can never know the things that God has in his heart. I mean, it can get things from God. God's good. He lets his rain fall on the just and the unjust. But Jim's not here. She's showing me signs here that I'm supposed to quit. Jim, if you're watching this, we went on. I'm not going to go a whole lot longer here, but, but I might because I'm capable of anything. All right, so he said, he hid, so it says that he hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. All right, I would think that's a common thing. People wouldn't want to look upon God for fear. But Moses ends up talking face to face with him. Ends up being with him where no one else is at. Being in a place that looked scary, Mount Sinai, that looked totally scary, loud. I mean, have you ever read what it says? I mean, it's just loud thunderings and lightning and all this stuff, you know. And one, one of the things is like a really, really loud horn that's just blowing. You go, dude, what is this? I would think you would have to really be focused if we don't train ourselves to be focused. I mean, you know, there are distractions during times when the word's being shared. And we can just go, you know, all the time or, you know. Or we can say, Lord, this, particularly, you know, particularly those times, this, I want to be with you, you know. Um, I know for a fact that it's real easy to let your mind stray and think about the laundry that's got to be done or something else, you know. But that's just that's just the that's just the taskmasters that are over you, driving you to just keep on doing the playing the game, doing the thing. Don't don't take any time to be with the Lord. Don't really set aside and just go. Or or when you get in service, just treat it like a a religious church service in the earth instead of a time that I could actually 
really move in more to him. So, you know, and those bats are all flying around. It's like, hallelujah. I'm reminded of Abraham when the Lord told him about this situation that was coming 400 years earlier. He said, offer this sacrifice, and he offered this sacrifice. And the fowls of the air, the vultures started coming down on it, on the sacrifice, and he chased it away so it would just be God's sacrifice. Get the vultures <laughs> out of the head, messing with the sacrifice and, and, and only picking flesh from it instead of the living reality of that. <clears throat> um, verse 7, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard. So I have seen and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large and a land flowing with milk and honey. This is all God. This is all him. We are always trying to get delivered. We're always trying to get to a certain place when... When he shows up, he starts doing what he does. The key is to not call it revival. The key is to find out why he's showing up now. What's in his heart? And guess what? It's not just, well, I just decided to do this for you. This will always go back to something. And can I just say it kind of like this? You don't have to fully embrace it. It'll always go back to the covenant he made originally that wasn't under the law. You know. Praise God. Okay. So uh, now let's look at uh, verse 18 and 20. Still in Exodus 3. <clears throat> And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt, he's talking about the, the leaders now, when Moses comes to them and tells them that God sent him. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Okay, remember, they went into Egypt, what, 70 people? They're going to come out a nation. They are now the Hebrews. They are not just this one family in, in the sense of the family that went in. Um, the, so now it's the Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go. Okay, so anybody ever heard that phrase, let my people go? Anybody ever heard that? Okay. Well, there is more to that. And he says, let, he says to him, now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. We are not just leaving on a three-day vacation. The rest that we need to enter into is not the flesh rest. It's not. It is his rest. And it all comes to rest at the cross. It all comes to rest at the sacrifice. Okay? Um, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Now, this is going to be significant because hopefully in the next class at least we will get to why it is significant. But it is so significant that he's saying let them go because we want to go sacrifice. Okay? And then verse 19, And I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. Remember, there were ten plagues. Nine of them did all this stuff and had no effect, and, the, and Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. Not one miracle, not one power move on the part of God changed anything well actually it did change something we'll see 
probably next class, it made Egypt more mad and they treated God's people worse. The miracles, the power made them mad. Let me just say this, you push, you're gonna get an equal and opposite reaction. It's called physics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so not by mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, after that, after that is when he presents the most drastic thing, which we're going to see, the slaughter of the lamb. And they'll come out with that. Not by miracle, not by incredible work done, but by, the, by a death of a small premature lamb. All right. And then after that, he will let you go. But then next, here in a moment, we're going we're gonna to look at actually what it is that he wants to let go, what he's after and what's in his heart. So let's stop. We'll take a break. <laughs>